Thank you all for attending this session. My name is Brock Blevins, and I am a co-lead for the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group. I'm also a training coordinator for Science Systems and Applications, Inc., or SSAI, and also with the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. For this session, we'll be covering Earth observations, otherwise known as remote sensing, and how they can be applied to ecological restoration. I'll first begin by stating that the content contained within this presentation is attributed to RCET, which is the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. RCET is a capacity building program within NASA's Applied Sciences Program. So here is the agenda for today. First, I'll cover how Earth observations can aid ecological restoration work. Then an overview of remote sensing. Now I understand this is a large subject, so I'll concentrate it into just the highlights. This will give a conceptual understanding of remote sensing and some of the terminology commonly used. Then I'll talk about a little bit about the remote sensing data sets and tools that can be used in restoration, followed by a demonstration and tours of common data visualization and data access portals, and then followed by a question and answer session. So how can Earth observations aid ecological restoration? So first let's address that remote sensing data sets or satellite imagery and tools to be most effective should be used in conjunction with in situ on the ground measurements and validation. However, satellite imagery can offer a number of qualities that can supplement restoration efforts. One is in the planning and design phase. Planning and monitoring of restoration projects or Establishing the scope and scale of restoration occur generally in a geographic context. An understanding of restoration needs and an initial assessment of the scale and scope of a project, as well as past and current conditions, is important. Indicators such as land use change provided by different satellites and airborne platforms can be helped in this restoration design. One can also use Earth observation as a tool to spatially analyze changing climatic conditions, especially on a landscape scale. Another way to use remote sensing is to assess eco ecological condition or extent. One can identify degradation, vegetation health, or identify evidence of invasive species. It can also be used to assess the impact of restoration projects or treatments over time. Additionally, they can provide ways to geographically communicate with stakeholders in management and policymaking. So briefly, EO or Earth observations can be another access point for environmental monitoring and land management data and their derived products. So now let's review remote sensing. Remote sensing is the science of obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance, typically from an aircraft or satellites, but it can also be from ground measurements, such as illustrated uh, with the image on the left. The process of acquiring data from aircraft or satellites involves the detection and measurements of radiation of different wavelengths reflected or emitted from distant objects and materials. So I'll be focusing mostly on satellite remote sensing and discussing how this works in this session. Um, your application will help you decide which platform is most useful to you. Uh, there are several questions that need to be answered to determine which platform is most useful, such as how much detail do you need? How frequently do you need this information? And I'll give you more information on how to answer these questions a little bit later in the presentation. As I mentioned before, electromagnetic radiation travels through space in the, wave, in the form of a wave. The waves have different lengths in different parts of the spectrum. This picture shows different wavelengths in the spectrum from short on the right to longer on the left. Although we are talking about light, most of the electromagnetic spectrum cannot be detected by the human eye. The only part that we see with our eye is the visible part of the spectrum shown in a very small sliver in the picture. Even satellite sensors only capture a small portion of the entire 
electromagnetic spectrum, uh, usually from visible to infrared and sometimes out to the microwave region. So how do satellites and sensors collect this information? Optical or passive remote sensing depends on the sun as the sole source of illumination. Solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, hits a target surface or surface such as forest or water or built up areas, and that is either transmitted, absorbed, or reflected. Different materials reflect and absorb differently at different wavelengths. Satellite sensors collect radiation at various wavelengths. This is a simplified example of what happens with elect electromagnetic energy for green vegetation. The figure on the left shows incoming radiation in the visible, so the blue, green, and red, and near infrared wavelengths. Blue and red wavelengths are absorbed by the green vegetation, and then the green and near infrared wavelengths are reflected. This is primarily because of the chlor chlorophyll within the leaves. So we see vegetation with our eyes or the sensors on the, on the satellites themselves as green because we only see the reflected energy of the visible wavelength. So we see green, but we can't see infrared. So that would be the healthy vegetation that we're, we're seeing in, in the green. There are several things we want to understand about using satellite observations. The sensors, the satellites, the orbits around the Earth, how that affects the spatial and temporal resolution. Um, you need to understand what kind of geophysical uh, quantities can be derived from these measurements. Uh, and lastly, the quality and accuracy of those data. First, it's important to understand that the satellite or platform carries sensors or instru instruments. Earth observation satellites typically have names such as ones listed here, Aqua or Landsat, and each satellite may carry one or two or more instruments. Uh, for example, the MODIS sensor is on both the Aqua and Terra satellites. So MODIS is either called Aqua MODIS or Terra MODIS. Uh, Landsat has, a, has many instruments. Um, some that you may have heard of is the OLI, Operational Land Imager, or TIS, the Thermal Infrared Sensor. So it's important to understand the difference between satellite and sensor. Another thing to keep in mind are the different spatial resolutions, and these can go from coarse to high. Uh, an example of coarse uh, would be MODIS, as you can see here. On the right, you can see a snapshot of the different swath widths. Now, this would be anything greater than 250 meters would be considered coarse spatial resolution. Um, but they can be used in a number of ways, even though it's not high resolution, uh, they're collected at a very high temporal resolution. So it can be used for early warning or detection um, for like forest clearing or fire detection. Medium spatial resolution, uh, also, also an optical, is, can be considered between 10 or 80 meters spatial resolution. Um, that's commonly used from Landsat, which is at 30 meters, uh, and more recently, uh, Sentinel-2, which should be even higher resolution. Um, some of the benefits of these satellites uh, is the historical archive. It goes back 30 years or more. They're easily accessible and freely available. In fact, all the data sets that we'll be talking about today are. Um, there's typically global coverage. Um, some of the limitations, because it is optical, is um, areas with persistent cloud cover can't always be seen. Some of the common tools that exist out there are like Global Forest Watch, um, which is derived from uh, medium spatial resolution. Um, this is very, a very useful tool if you're not familiar with that. Uh, the higher spatial resolution can be considered anything better than 10 meter spatial resolution. And uh, a lot of times this can be commercial imagery. So there will be a, sometimes a cost associated with that. But uh, just to let you know that that's when we talk about high spatial resolution, that's what we're talking about. And some of the limitations should be the, the temporal coverage may not be uh, as, as often as you want in your particular area of, of, of interest. Another remote sensing data source is SAR or synthetic aperture radar. 
um, this can get down to the one, this can go from 80 to one meter spatial resolutions. Some examples of this is the Sentinel data products uh, provided by the European Space Agency. Where these are useful is, well, one is the spatial resolutions, usually a bit better. It's useful in areas of persistent cloud cover because they can see through clouds. They can provide information on forest structure uh, and really just uses a complement to optical data as well. So when you use those in conjunction, it's, it's very useful. Uh, some of the limitations is that it can be difficult to process. It takes a, 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 lot of, a lot of practice, let's put it that way. Each type of orbit has varying spatial coverage and temporal resolution. So these are a couple different uh, orbits to keep in mind. Um, Polar orbiting satellites, as you see on the left, they have global coverage and measurements can vary from once a month to once a day, so a nice high temporal coverage. Nonpolar orbiting satellites have non-global coverage with varied temporal frequency, um, so a lot of times less than one time per day. Geostationary satellites have limited spatial cover, uh, so one, more than one satellite is needed for total global, global coverage, as you can see from the GOES image here, uh, and these are typically used in, in, in weather and meteorological applications. But what's really nice here is you get a lot of observations per day, so the temporal resolution is very high, so you get many per day. Next I'll discuss sensor characteristics. Two types of sensors exist, passive and active. A passive system needs an external energy source, and in most cases this is the sun. Um, so these sensors detect reflected and emitted energy from the objects on the Earth. An active sensor system, as you see on the right, provides its own energy source. As an example, a radar. Um, the radar sensor sends out sound waves and records the reflection waves coming back from the surface. Since they don't need the sun, active sensors can be used day or night, and they can also penetrate cloud cover. It's a major advantage. Uh, the disadvantage used in these data sets is that they're very challenging to process and interpret, and sometimes you have to get really used to the software to do so. Radar and LIDAR sensors are also typically used to acquire topographic information. Briefly, we're just going to cover the advantages and disadvantages of remote sensing observations. Some of the advantages of Earth observations that they're available for large regions or wall-to-wall -wall coverage. They can provide information where no ground-based measurements are available or sometimes inaccessible. You can get remote sensing information from just about every spot on the Earth, and those data are temporally consistent. Um, it's usually much, it's much less expensive to acquire information about the Earth than ground-based data. Many satellites have been in operation for a long time, and this assists in our ability to establish landscape baselines and to track changes over time. Another advantage is that they are consistent measurements globally, and they can be easily compared across regions. There's a diversity of measurements from spectral reflectance that can be used to measure vegetation health to soil moisture and canopy data. While technologies have the ability to greatly aid restoration activities, there's also some limitations that should be considered. The disadvantages, especially compared to ground data, is that remote sensing data typically do not provide as high level of detail, and you cannot detect land cover through tree canopy or underwater. You really need both remote sensing data, data and ground data to get the complete picture of an area. A level of technical expertise is required to process interp and interpret, but this is doable. And there's always a trade-off. Uh, due to pure physics of the sensors and orbits, it's impossible to have satellite imagery to have high spatial, high spectral, and high temporal resolution all at the same time. Okay, so this is the fun part the geophysical quantities that Earth observation can produce, produce and their applications. Here I've listed both vegetation indices and biophysical parameters that can be used to measure and quantified with satellites and sensors. 
The vegetation indices are generally calculated as a ratio of reflectance values from different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, along with some other biophysical characteristics. Other parameters require ground-based data in conjunction with remote sensing data to generate land cover maps, for example. I'll discuss MDVI and phenology, uh, but also touch on some of the others listed here. These quantities and data products on the previous slide can be used to evaluate impacts of restoration and determine future actions. One can monitor growing seasons or vegetation patterns. We can see relationships with species, species richness and vegetation. And we can assess ecological condition or degradation or vegetation health. So let's relate some of these products with ecological characteristics. Plant phenology is the annual dynamic of vegetation greenness that can be tracked using vegetation indices. In the graph in the top, you can see the progression of vegetation dynamics as seasons change. In North America, for example, earlier in the year, which is winter, there are little to no leaves on the trees res resulting in a low NDVI value. When spring arrives, the vegetation greens up and NDVI increases until it peaks in the summer. Then as vegetation loses their leaves, the NDVI declines. The image below shows the difference in greenness in the winter versus the summer in North America. So you can think of phenology as a study of the pulse of our planet, and it is an essential and critical component of environmental science influencing biodiversity, species interactions, and their ecological functioning, and their effects on fluxes of water, energy, and biogeochemical elements at various scales. Changes in phenology depict an integrated response to environmental change and they can provide valuable information for global change research, land degradation studies, integrated pest and invasive species management, drought monitoring, wildfire risk, and agricultural production. Remote sensing plays an important role in observing the seasonal pattern of variation in vegetated land surfaces, which is considered land surface phenology. Satellite remote sensing data, data are widely applicable to studying regional and global patterns. Without a moderate spatial resolution, these satellites pro provide global daily measurements of land service properties, and therefore they're well suited for monitoring the seasonal patterns and trends due to regional and global phenological variation and change. One way to see phenology is via NDVI, or the Normalized Difference of Vegetation Index, NDVI. NDVI is the most widely used land surface parameter for monitoring phenological shifts. As an overview of how this is calculated, briefly, an overview of how this is calculated, when the sunlight strikes plant leaves, the chlorophyll in those leaves strongly absorb visible light, blue and red, as we discussed before. And the cell structure of the leaves reflects green and strongly reflects near infrared light. This is portrayed in the graphic on the right. The two key wavelengths for NDVI are the red and near infrared. In the graph, you can see where the red is being absorbed low reflectance, and the near infrared is highly reflective. Using mathematical formulas or algorithms, scientists can transform this raw satellite data about these light waves into vegetation indices. Is an indicator that describes the greenness or the relative density and health of vegetation for each picture element or pixel in the satellite image. NDVI can also be used to better understand phenology of plants throughout the year, particularly to and track green up events. NDVI has also been used recently by farmers to improve agricultural production and manage water resource. Using average NDVI values in a particular region, periods of reduced plant growth relative to the average due to lack of precipitation can be an indicator of drought. This may also relate to soil moisture in a region. Some other applications include carbon monitoring, or essentially can re reveal where vegetation is thriving and where it's under stress. There are other indices such as enhanced vegetation in index or EVI that can be useful. EVI is another measure of vegetation health that's particularly useful in regions with high biomass because the NDVI can oversaturate or hit a maximum value in these regions where the EVI has a higher threshold it can identify more subtle differences in these regions, for example, in the Amazon, if that happens to be your region of interest. 
The Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, or SAVI, minimizes the influence of bare to nearly bare ground when trying to assess vegetation. So this will be in your more arid regions. This one can be used in the semi-arid and arid regions, like in the southwestern United States, where there's a greater bare to ground or soil cover in relation to the vegetation. Here, the near infrared and red bands are still used, but a correction factor is, is, is involved. The Normalized Difference Moisture Index, or the NDMI, uses a short wave infrared band, which is more sensitive to water within vegetation. Thus, it can detect subtle changes in vegetation moisture and is a good index to evaluate drought too. This can also be useful in identifying fuels and forests to, to determine susceptibility to large wildfires. So now let's talk about how remote sensing can be used for land cover mapping and classification and change detection. Land cover mapping and classification can be used in all phases of restoration from design to assessing condition to impact. And using these land cover maps in a time series, we can produce change detection maps. And this can be used to, to direct where restoration should be implemented, or monitoring restoration over time. The process of land cover mapping involves turning satellite data into thematic information about the region. The primary method of doing this is called image classification. On the left is a Landsat image of Lake Tahoe and its surrounding forests. However, the Landsat image cannot tell you where the lake is actually water or the forest is actually forest. The classified image on the right shows how the pixel information in the satellite image can be transformed into land cover maps. Image classification is the process of turning pixel data into information. For carbon monitoring, it is primarily used for mapping forest versus non-forested land, mapping land cover, or stratifying forest types. There's many ways to do image classification. Three are visual interpretation, pixel-based, and object-based. It's important to understand that image classification needs ground or other ancillary information to improve or verify results. Also, image classification requires specialized software and an open source version of such could be QGIS or uh, a commercial software such as ArcMap or NV. Two different methods are typically used to create land cover maps. The supervised method uses a pixel-based approach. The supervised method uses a user-defined area of known land cover types that are called training areas. These areas are then used to define the statistical parameters of the classification algorithms. The algorithm then automatically identifies and labels all the pixels and segments that are st statistically similar to that training data. In the unsupervised method, the classification algorithm assigns each pixel into one of a number of user-specified classes. Then interpreters assign each one of the pixel groups a value corresponding to a land cover class. Next is change detection. This is the where and the when. Detecting change of the Earth's surface features is extremely important to understanding relationships and interactions between humans and natural phenomena. The questions that can be answered using remote sensing include the where and the when this change has taken place. What is the quantity of the change? What is the nature of the change? And lastly, what are the cycles and trends in the change over time? These images show growth of Santiago, Chile between 1975 and 2013 using the Landsat sensor. There are several broad categories of change that you can detect with satellite imagery. These include change in shape or size of patches. Urbanization is an example of that. Slow change in cover type is more difficult to detect than abrupt changes due to, let's say, wildfire or deforestation. Slow changes in the condition of a single cover type, like forest degradation due to, like, say, insect or disease, can be easily or difficult depending on the extent of the damage. Lastly, changes in this timing or extent of seasonal processes, such as decreased rainfall and its effect on vegetation, can be monitored using satellite imagery as well. The way we detect change using satellite imagery is by detecting changes in the spectral values in the pixels. 
pixels will have different values before and after the change has occurred. In this example, we can see healthy vegetation as high reflectance in the near infrared. Burned areas are the opposite, with low reflectance in the near infrared. So you can use that information not only to detect burned areas, but also detect the severity of the burn. The goals of detecting change in satellite imagery included identifying the location and type of the change, quantify the change and assess the accuracy of the results. But it's important to understand that identifying the location and quantifying change is relatively easy. Identifying what caused the change sometimes is not. Okay, since ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed, I must highlight this next tool. If you're familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 15, Life on Land, has a couple indicators and sub-indicators related to land degradation. There's some really good work done by the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification and Conservation International, who partnered on a NASA-funded project called Trends.Earth. Quickly, Target 15.3 states, by 2030, to combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and strive to achieve a land de degradation neutral world. These sub-indicators include land cover and land cover change, land productivity, and carbon stocks above and below ground. A combination of satellite earth observation and site-based data is needed to set the baselines to determine the initial status, detect change in these sub-indicators, and derive an indicator by determining which areas of change are considered land degradation. To this end, the Trends.Earth tool incorporates a number of global data sets into its platform, and it can produce results in the format being asked for by the UN Custodial Agency for Target 15.3 or the UNCCD. Trends.Earth is an open source platform. The project is making it available as a global public good. The project has, de has developed methods and guidance on assessing land degradation and has implemented these methods through QGIS, the open source GIS. Trends.Earth facilitates the downloading and the visualizing data sets produced in the project. It includes routines for mapping and calculating vegetation indices and studying trends and productivity. It supports comparing analytical outputs derived from coarse and medium resolution data sets. It allows users to integrate ground data sets and earth observation data. And as I mentioned before, it supports the reporting to the UNCED and GEF, including production of summary tables and maps. It also has a number of guidance documents and other training materials, so anybody can learn how to use them. So all these data products are open, free of cost. You can use them too. We just need to know where to find them. So on the subject of phenology, the European Space Agency also has a suite of satellites that can be used. Um, I've outlined two here, Sentinel-2 and the Spot Constellation. Sentinel-2 is similar to Landsat with an improved resolution of 10 to 20 meters for the visible and infrared and near infrared. It also has a shorter revisit time of about five days. Much work has gone into creating a harmonized Landsat and Sentinel product, which you can find through the link here. And I'll make this presentation available for you uh, so you can uh, check out all these links. There's many spot satellites created by the French Space Agency. Most commonly are the version 6 and 7 spot data. They have visible and near infrared bands. And they have higher, higher spatial resolution of about six meters with a fairly frequent revisit time. I also want to note that the European Space Agency also has a variety of similar products available using these satellites like Sentinel and Spot. These include NDVI, FPAR, Leaf Area Index. I've also included a link here to ESA's Copernicus Global Land Service site here so you can explore these data sets in more, de more depth if you're interested. 
the Copernicus Open Access Hub provides complete free and open access to Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-3 user products. Anyone can register via self-registration. The self-registration product is automatic and immediate. Registration grants access rights to searching and downloading Sentinel products. And the Sentinel products are available at no cost to anybody. So you can search, view, and download data via this portal. On the subject of Landsat, there's a lot of websites you can obtain Landsat images. I think this is often sometimes confusing because many of the sites function in the same way. In general, people tend to use the sites that are they're most familiar with. However, it's probably a good idea to take, at the various take a look at the various places where you can obtain the data and see which one you prefer in regards to how the data is visualized and how you can download that imagery. And here's a few examples here. There's also many places to obtain MODIS data as they're listed here. And I'll go through a couple of these a little bit in a little bit more detail. NASA Worldview. It's a web-based application for an interactive browsing experience for global full resolution satellite imagery. You can also download that underlying data. The browse feature lets you step through time. And it's really useful if you want to search image scenes without having the effort of processing that data to find certain features. It provides the capability to interactively browse with over 900 global data sets. Many of the imagery layers are updated daily and are available within three hours of observation, essentially showing the Earth as it looks right now. This is also a great place to find the most MODIS data in quick order. NASA's Earth Data Search is a map-based interface where a user can search for Earth science data, filter results based on spatial or temporal restraints. You can order the data with customizing, including reformatting, reprojecting, uh, spatial and parameter subsetting. This is also a link to the other various NASA data centers or DACs, such as the LPDAC, as, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this tool has all the MODIS and VIRS data, and I think it's a great resource for folks who know what they want and they can find their specific data easily. Appears is the application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples. Uh, it's a data subsetter that provides access and value exploration for a variety of data from federal archives. Appears offers users a simple and efficient way to perform processing, processing of that data, such as subsetting spatially, temporally, by layer, and it greatly reduces the amount of data needed to be downloaded. Sample requests submitted into Appears provide users with data values and associated quality data for a variety of remote sensing data products. Two types of sample requests are available, point samples and area samples. You can also interact with the data through visualizations with summary statistics prior to downloading. Climate Engine harnesses the power of Google Earth Engine through a, a map and geographical interface that's pretty easy to use. It has a variety of data sets like NDVI from Landsat and MODIS. You can make a map like the one shown here. This is a median NDVI from last year of a mixed forest and agricultural region in Brazil. You can also evaluate statistics and select different time periods. You can select specific region by drawing a polygon on the map and then create a time series of one or two variables directly in the interface. You can also download that data as a CSV or a GeoTIFF for that particular area. Google Earth Engine also has some incredible functionality. You can access many NASA and ESA data sets for their collection and conduct analysis like calculating vegetation indices, land cover classification, change detection, and here's a screenshot of the code editor, which is its primary inter interface. You can write scripts in Java or Python. It's free to sign up, and usually the approval occurs after about a day or so. So before I close, I just want to touch on a couple additional resources. Uh, one 
entity I wanted to make you aware of is the Group on Earth Observations. Uh, this is an intergovernmental organization. Uh, they work on you know, improving the availability and access of Earth observations for societal benefit. Um, they're very well versed and engaged in the UN 2030 Agenda, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, Sendai for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, it has a lot of different societal benefit areas that you may find of interest. So I at least want to make you aware of the activities and the different working groups that uh, is involved in GEO. So please check this out when you have time. And also we have a couple other capacity building programs just to name a few. Uh, one in which I'm from is the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. A lot of online trainings series to build specific skills on accessing in both beginner and advanced training series. You also have UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Also wanna make you aware of um, the CIAS. Uh, it's the Working Group on Capacity Building and Data Democracy or WGCAPD. They're putting out some great training materials as well. Also want to let you know about the Synthetic Aperture Radar Remote Sensing Capacity Building Center. Um, SAR is uh, a little bit more difficult to work with, but they have some great training resources to really ramp you up so you feel more, so you can get more familiar with those data sets. So that's just to name a few. And there are many more. So before we go to Q&A, I just want to plug next month's session. So on March 19th, uh, we're going to have a presentation from Judy Fisher. She is the thematic leader for the Ecosystems and Invasive Species Thematic Group of the CEM. And she'll be talking to us about measuring the ecological and economic effectiveness of restoration from baseline biodiversity data. All right, so let's go to Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, hello. Hopefully you all can hear me and see me now that I've stopped sharing the screen. Um, thank you very much for all your questions and your attention here today. Actually, I see quite a, quite a few familiar names in the participant list. Um, I'm not sure if the attendees can see the participant list, but we have about 160 some people on here today from all over the globe. So um, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, let's go to the questions here. Um, we had quite a few and let me, I have a couple computers open here where I can kind of see everything. Um, the question here about, um, different active sensors um, that can be used for sensing vegetation. I also had questions about different passive sensors. And I reviewed a couple of them there, um, but I didn't really give a, a full list. Um, these can be found many places, but I'll just touch upon a couple. And these are, I'm just gonna touch on open data, um, not the commercial type. Um, I figure sometimes cost might be an issue. so. I'm just going to talk about the open data. So when it comes to active sensors, um, you're talking about uh, either radar or LIDAR. Uh, for radar, um, the Sentinel-1 satellite for the European Space Agency, that is open data. It's been going since 2014. Um, ALOS PALSAR, that mission is over, but the data can be found. That ran from 2002 to 2012. Um, also in the future, we're really looking forward to the launch of both NISAR, which is a joint mission between the Indian Space Agency, ISRO, and NASA. And look for that to come out in the next couple of years. Sometimes these, these missions get pushed back um, for various reasons. Uh, and then there's another one coming up called Biomass, um, which should be of uh, great interest when it comes to forest structure data. Uh, LiDAR sensors, there's a couple now that are available. Uh, one that's on the International Space Station. Um, it's called JEDI, which is a great name. It's spelled G-E-D-I. Uh, it's the Global Ec Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation uh, Mission, or the sensor. Um, and it's, uh, 
it's on the it's a high resolution laser ranging. Um, it's looking at topography. It's looking at uh, forests. Um, so look for that. That data is available through a couple different uh, NASA DACs. I don't think it's in Google Earth Engine just yet, but if you're looking for it, you can find it at the LP DAC and the Oak Ridge National Lab as well. Um, some other ones uh, that you might be interested in when it comes to active is the ISAT missions. Um, so they have a, a, a laser ranging on that one uh, called GLASS, the geoscience laser. It's an altim altimeter. Um, and then the ISAT-2 is also now available, so a follow-on mission. When it comes to the passive, uh, it's a lot of the common ones. Um, so these are the optical imagery. Uh, can't see through clouds, so sometimes that will be a problem. So you might have to put together time, uh, a, a range of different images, uh, and then sort of put those together in order to see the place that you're looking for. So maybe on just one day, you're not always going to get the, the measurements, but over time, and you can start to put those together. Uh, that would be MODIS. Uh, that's a sensor on Aqua and Terra, um, the Landsat missions, uh, Suomi MPP and VIRS. VIRS is basically the, the follow-on to um, the MODIS uh, sensor. Um, SMAP, which is a soil moisture active passive. So there was a question about, uh, is there any uh, data available on soil? And yes, there is on soil moisture. Um, actually uses a little bit of a radar to get down to a certain depth of the, of the soil. Um, but uh, yeah, so SMAP is another one. And then of course the Sentinel products are all available as well. Um, let me see here. I'm gonna go to another question. Uh, there's a question about atmospheric data. And yeah, I didn't talk too much about this. Um, I kind of focused on uh, a lot of the land. Another thing I didn't talk about is the marine. I saw a question about that too, marine and coastal ecosystems, um, detecting those. Um, but when it comes to atmospheric, um, there's a, quite a bit of data available for this. Um, Aqua and Terra have this available uh, through the MODIS um, sensors. Uh, Aura or the Suomi N NPP, the VIRS data will, will capture this. Um, some of the sensors like OMI, or trope only. And then of course the geostationary satellites, um, the GOES missions, uh, they're kind of setting them up. Since they are geostationary, they're getting a high resolution or temporal resolution, capturing the same place all the time. That's really, that's why they're really useful um, for weather and atmospheric type uh, uh, work operationally and, and through studies. And they're kind of basically setting up a, a series of them around the globe so we can kind of grab global coverage uh, when you put them all together. Uh, there's a question about uh, fire products. And uh, yeah, this is uh, definitely an area that is, um, is very active. Um, one is I'm going to kind of promote a, a great tool that's uh, produced by Conservation International. It's called Firecast. Um, that's, uh, if you just kind of Google that, uh, it's, it's a great tool for early detection of, of fires. Um, and then also the Veers products um, has an active fire detection. That's a great resource. Um, so please check those out as well. Uh, let me see some other questions here. Oh, and that question about fires. That, that, had, that was in the context of um, uh, whether it can be used in Australia or the California fires. And yeah, all these are global products. So uh, pretty much everything I talked about here, you can capture from wherever you are, for the most part. I had a question here. Um, do any of the common platforms and sensors have a formal systematic program for ground truthing? Um, unfortunately not. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, but you will have to do that yourself in order to get a certain level of verification and accuracy. They do have validation built into these data products to a certain level. Um, but if you really want to get down to that like real ground truth thing, um, that is something that you have to verify in situ. Okay, here. Um, yeah, is there a possibility of utilizing remote sensing and satellite for marine biodiversity assessments? Yes, 
So I mentioned the group on uh, Earth observations and they have a biodiversity observation network that is part of that. They also have what's called MBON, which is the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. Uh, so yeah, there, um, there's uh, new data products uh, being used, uh, being developed all the time when it comes to observing marine. Um, you do have a problem with the water column correction when it comes to these things. So at, when you start to get to certain depths, which isn't very far down, it starts to become a problem, but there are ways to correct for that. So most of the work has been done along coastal areas um, where you know uh, a lot of impact can be, can be seen and there's a lot of social economic uh, concerns. So um, there's a, a number of satellites here. Let me, um, I know I had it here. Um, I was pulling some of these up here. Um, one is uh, HICO, which is the hyperspectral imager for coastal ocean that ran from 2009 to 2014. Um, but also look for uh, the PACE mission, which is called the Plankton Aerosol Clouds and Ocean Ecosystems uh, PACE mission, um, which we're all very excited about. It is not up yet, but um, that will be something that you should keep tabs on. So once that data uh, starts to become available, that'd be wonderful. In fact, if you go and you, if you're interested in kind of getting interest or getting used to the data sets and the scientific applications, the real world applications uh, of these things, um, there's uh, an early adopters group um, and, and, and meetings that uh, you can read into and maybe even get involved in um, to start to get a, an idea of what this data is gonna look like in the future um, before it's even launched. So please take a look at that. Um, let's see here, what else we got? Where can I download land cover data with high spatial resolution? That's the thing. Um, when it becomes high spatial resolution, that's when you really start to get into your, your commercial data sets. So there will be a cost involved. Um, so uh, GOI, uh, I, I don't work a lot with these, uh, but there are um, commercial satellites that are collecting at a high resolution. Um, for, for a program like NASA, we are actually um, not allowed to compete with commercial interests. So we uh, don't have data products that will surpass the capabilities of some of those. Um, but if you're looking for high spatial resolution, um, you can download them, but there would likely be a cost involved. Um, let's see here. Okay, yeah, so uh, Google Earth Engine. Uh, there's a question here, how can I get um, some, some beginner training on Google Earth Engine? Um, and some of the codes that, they, that you can use. Um, there's some great training materials out there. Um, I'll put a couple links in the, uh, the chat here. Um, I can also include a, a couple things uh, in, in a follow-up email to everybody um, that I usually send. And so Google Earth Engine has a, a lot of tutorials that they do themselves. And then there's also some remote sensing capacity building programs who are putting on trainings and webinar series uh, that show you how to do this, where they develop the code themselves, they share it with you through a link. And if you have a Google Earth Engine account, it, you can access that. And then you can go in and just make a little bit of changes like changing the Latin long, where you can just maybe center in on to your specific region of interest. Um, so my program, the uh, Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, we've done a number, number of these, uh, working with SAR data, working with hyperspectral data, um, working with um, looking at mangroves. Um, and I'll, I'll put a couple of links in the chat here. Be sure to grab them before we leave. And um, I'll, I'll stay on a little bit after this to make sure that uh, I, I have time to put them in there. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've done a, quite a few Google Earth Engine uh, trainings. And it, it really does start at the beginning. We, we try to really serve it up to you so you can get used to the, the, the functionality uh, of and it's very powerful. They're pulling in new data sets from the different space agencies all the time. And um, it's just a great resource because you can set a 
a, a processing function in the cloud. So you don't have to do that download and use your actual um, computer power to do that. Um, it's all up in the cloud and processed in the cloud. So uh, that's one of the really nice features of Google Earth Engine. So um, that is certainly something you should check out. Uh, another question about high resolution. Sorry, I, I, I already mentioned that. Um, is there any data available on seagrass meadows? And where can we find them or which sensors? Um, yeah, so this kind of goes into our, our, our coastal um, trainings. And let me see here. Um, when it comes to the sea grass, um, you'll you'll be looking at some, you know, optical imagery. So Landsat, Sentinel, um, with the different um, land cover classifications, uh, you should be able to detect those. Um, there's also certain things uh, along the coast uh, where you can pick up uh, water quality indicators. Um, so you can pick up things like CDOM or dissolved organic matter sea surface temperature, chlorophyll A. Um, so there are a, a number of qualities that can be used when you're talking about a coastal system uh, and, and things that can affect it or disturb it. Um, so I, uh, I was just pulling up one of our, our previous trainings on that just to get a little bit familiar. I did not actually teach that one, but um, there, there is quite a bit to, uh, to be said when it comes to co coastal systems and and uh, seagrasses is, is one thing that you can pick up for sure. You probably would need some on the ground validation to make sure that what you're seeing in your maps, and you can make your own maps with, with some of these land cover classification techniques um, uh, to make sure that you know, on your maps for your, for your reasons are, 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 are accurate. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Is there a reasonable way to discriminate between submerged aquatic vegetation and filamentous algae growing on structures in tidal areas in shore? I think that you're gonna run into a problem when it comes to the submerged aquatic vegetation. I guess it, I'm not real familiar with that, but uh, I guess it depends on how, how submerged it is due to the, the water column uh, issues that you might run into. Um, but I will uh, actually, let me just post this in the chat right now. Um, and the resources I have right now are, are, are from our program. Um, there's probably many, out, more, many more out there that exist. Um, but the ones I'm going to post are the ones that uh, I do know about. So I, if I can just give you a quick resource, I'll, I, I will put it in here in the chat. And this was last year on remote sensing of coastal ecosystems. Um, so it kind of goes over all the different satellites, uh, how they're used, and some of the uh, limitations and thus that you need to pay attention to when it comes to those. Give me one second. I'll put that in there. This one was also. Um, deliver in English and Spanish. So if uh, Spanish, uh, you will hopefully find that, that resource uh, very acceptable. Moment, let me find the chat. Okay, if you're interested in coastal uh, remote sensing, there's a, there's a link in there as well. Uh, what applications of earth systems are you aware for assessing freshwater, river or lake ecosystems? Um, yeah, so there's a number of parameters that we could talk about when it comes to river and lake ecosystems. Um, one, I'll say that some issues that we'll run into is the size of the lake or river. Um, the spatial resolution sometimes is not enough to look at some of the rivers, unless they're a nice big river, and some of the lakes uh, might be too small uh, to accurately detect with um, uh, optical imagery. 
but there are also different parameters um, that you want to look at. Okay, so you have the ecosystems, you have the different um, uh, vegetation around them, things like that. Uh, you should be able to pick up on those. But when we're talking about like um, uh, the different uh, bathymetries, the different um, calculations of, of, of water budgets, things like that, reservoirs, lakes, um, there's a number of things that you can use. And um, actually, let me, let me just throw another resource at you here. Um, let me just find it. There you go. We have one actually going on right now called Mapping and Monitoring Lakes and Reservoirs with Satellite Observations. I know that doesn't really get into the ecosystem part as much, but these are some parameters that you can, that, that can be used there. Uh, there's water quality um, parameters that you can look at. Once again, those will be more useful on your larger areas like the coasts or large lakes, um, like say the Great Lakes, for instance. Um, let me just find this one on lakes and reservoirs. So I don't see a lot more questions coming in. I don't think I skipped over any. Um, let me see here. But I'd also like to ask you, are there uh, certain things that, I mean, I can sort of deduce by looking at your, your questions and things that you're interested in, um, but uh, you know, when I was preparing this presentation, um, you know, I, I, I figured there was a wide range of experience when it comes to satellite imagery and Earth observations, uh, as far as the participants that would be showing up here today. So I try to keep it uh, kind of basic and introductory, um, but also give you paths to go down if that was too introductory to go deeper into some of these uh, more advanced topics when it comes to processing and very specific data sets. Um, so I, I guess what I would like to ask you is, uh, what are some of the limitations that you've probably run into when it comes to um, using Earth observations for your work? Have you, have you ever, I mean, you can write this in the chat. Um, have you ever considered using Earth observations in your work? Um, maybe just didn't know where to start looking for it. Um, that's one of the, uh, the things I try to personally address when it comes to using remote sensing um, as, as a complement to in situ work. Um, it has a, a lot of great advantages that I spoke about before, um, but sometimes it might seem a little intimidating, but it, it really doesn't have to be. I try to, in our program, create the widest on-ramp, if you will, uh, for anybody with you know, very little experience to get used to the, the, the fundamentals, to really start to understand it, to, to really look at these things from an application. So I, I think that's how people come at this. They're like, okay, I have an application. Um, there's something I wanna do with it. Um, and I have a very specific place in mind. Um, so, uh, I, I try to concentrate on, okay, so what do you want to do with this? What are some problems you want to solve? What are some of the decisions you want to affect in a positive way? And how can these possibly help you? So um, when we design our trainings, we start with those questions at first, and we try to really just to, to build skills. Um, so uh, in an introductory training, we're going to you know, expose you to the data sets, get you familiar with it. But uh, also teach you at least some click sequences on the data portals and how to find it and different caveats of one portal to another or one data set to another, just so you kind of know that what you're using, you feel more confident using it. Uh, and then we'll relate that to different case studies, how people have used it, and then maybe you can replicate those types of that type of work uh, where you are. Let's see, I saw 
Yeah, one limitation, not knowing to look for the products. And that's one of the things that we, we always uh, try to do is just show you the different access points. And I do understand that it can seem uh, a little overwhelming because there are so many different portals being created. Um, if I go to find Landsat data or Sentinel data in portal A versus portal B, what's the difference? Um, so we try to clear all that up for you. And, and, and it's really about the demo accessing uh, when it comes to it. Uh, when you get a little bit more advanced and you get familiar with it, um, we, we teach you how to do even further processing on your own, um, how to start incorporate, incorporating those in models, uh, provide scripts that can be run. So, uh, so hopefully uh, you guys have a chance to check these things out when it comes to remote sensing data or earth observations in general. The space agencies um, really have a, an application wing, an operational wing, um, where we're looking to, you know, for societal benefit to use these in an altruistic way, um, not just for research, but for um, policy making. Um, I mean, you can even use these things in proposal writing, if you will, um, to uh, secure grants for, for your research. Um, so some of these sort of broad swaths, maybe you don't have to get down to the, the um, the significant digits when it comes to the data, but you just need to know um, some green, red, or yellow decisions, um, up or down, left or right, just show me a little bit which way I should go. Where's the soil moisture? Where is it not? Uh, is it on this side of the hill? Which way should we take our transport? Uh, things like that. Um, and then you have modeled climactic conditions, um, things like that, so you can maybe project into the future. Um, so anyways, I know that we're coming at time and I hope that you enjoyed this. Feel free to reach out to me um, if, if you have any questions and I can provide you with any more um, instruction on how to kind of dig deeper into all this and, and hopefully you can use it in your work and supplement your, your, your on the ground restoration projects, whether it comes to planning, um, or monitoring impact uh, efficacy of the treatments. Um, so thank you very much for joining. I will paste a few uh, general trainings right now that you can see as curriculums, if you will. Now it's coming from my, my, pro my project uh, at RSET, uh, but it's rather versed. You know, we've had, um, over 50,000 people in the last 10 years take our trainings and almost half of it came from this last year. Um, so we're growing every day um, and um, rather big webinar series that we'll do, we'll do like three in a row. So in the first week we'll introduce you, second week we'll take you a little bit further and they all kind of build on each other. So I'll paste some um, uh, about four or five links for you to uh, dive down deeper um, if you don't mind me promoting a little bit of this, but it's all open and free. Uh, NASA data, a lot of the space agencies have adopted an open data policy. Um, and to go along with that is the open training and capacity building um, thing uh, and events. So uh, everything I post here, you're able to uh, go through at your own pace. All the upcoming trainings, you can join live. Um, but all of our past ones that you're able to uh, self-pace through, all the recordings are there, the exercises are there, the homeworks are there. So if you are so inclined, you can ramp yourself up uh, to become proficient and be a little bit more familiar with these things. So anyways, uh, I will post these and thank you very much for joining. And uh, I hope to see you next, next, uh, next month. That'd be March 19th. So thank you very much.